Texas. Thanks, Bill. And you're listening to the Bill Hallwig Memorial Summer Season every Thursday on the Sonic Society feed. Brought to you by Broken Sea Audio at BrokenSea.com and everyone who loved and knew Bill Hallwig. The theme music for this special series, Mr. Buccaneer, comes to us courtesy of Howl O at H-O-W-L-O at WordPress.com. I'm Jack Ward. And we're back tonight to talk about this week's retrospective 2109 Black Sun Rising, episodes 1 to 3, with our amigos Jeff Billard and Lothar Tuppen. How are you tonight, brothers? Fabulous, Jack. Thanks for having me back again. Hi, Lothar. Hey guys, it's Lothar, and uh, yeah, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. This, thanks, Jeff and Jack. This is a uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. This is the 2109 was one of Bill's original shows, not based on anything else. Uh, where, does anybody have any history as to how he came up with the idea? I do not. Um, I know some more stuff afterwards, but uh, the, I guess the only thing I know is he wanted to do something that actually brought in some real Navy experience, and that was something that he and Matt Weller brought to it was um, they felt that in a lot of the uh, sci-fi shows, they don't really get the whole sort of feeling that, you know, this is an extension to the Navy, and it should feel like a Navy show, not just something sort of made up out of some civilian's head. And I know that was one of the impetuses, but I don't know, Jeff, did you have any insight in that? He didn't really. It, it was, uh, he wrote it about 2009, 2010. I had just started doing stuff with him around that point. So I got the I got the script and he asked me to play uh, Commander Hightower and I was I was honored to do that. But I I just think like you said, Lothar, he was he was trying to he was trying to write something that was science fiction but it had some realism to it. It, it was really from the heart. You could really see Bill in this whole script, there's no question. Yeah. And there was a couple of things that struck me as I re-listened to everything. Here's a couple of things that I came up with. Number one, Bill should have gotten a massive sponsorship deal with the amount of coffee that was drank on that show. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's just like every time he went to went to the spaceship, there were, you could hear people drinking coffee everywhere. This is like, and of course, this is Bill. Bill lived on coffee, right? Yes. Yep. It's a, it yep. was his signature. It was his signature sound effect. <laughs> yep. There's no question. The only problem with the sponsorship is who would actually like be saying, yes, we are the worst coffee in the universe. <laughs> because that was the one thing is that it always, this tastes like bleep. You know? That's true. I forgot about that. So that wouldn't have worked out very well. That runs through all of his work, that, that whole coffee. Unless he said, you know, it was it was sponsored by this coffee, not supplied for 2109 <laughs> actors. Or whatever, yeah. right? The other thing that got me was the Jillian Carmen storyline. What was up with that? At first I looked at it and I thought, it always kind of confused me because it totally was off the rail from the actual original story. It was just a secondary story that he sort of threw up. That I can speak more to because um, <laughs> that deals with Carlson, who was so much fun to play. And when you did Bill it so went, well. Yes. I can't remember what it was. It was some small part that I did for somebody somewhere, and Bill went, oh, you'd be perfect as a spook. So he started writing this role for me. And at first, you know, in the, in the prequel log, it's just this sort of standard CIA guy. And then by the time he started mixing the first uh, full episode, he had this whole subplot of Dr. Dane and me and all this stuff that was going on specifically about these weird shenanigans that were going on in the shadow government that was going to happen. And replicants and yes, everything. Too. Exactly. And then he's like, well, you're such a sleaze bag. I want you to like, basically, you're going to overreach yourself and start being your own worst enemy because you just think that no one can touch you. And that'll start off with the, you know, the sexual shenanigans between, you know, where I'm having an affair with Jillian and Carmen at the same time. And the two of them are best friends. And then, of course, it turns out that Jillian G is a clone mm -hmm. and is always been cloned and carlson carlson is like the big uh architect behind that i think and he was he hadn't decided because you know he hadn't written the rest of the of the subplots for the for the existing scripts yet and didn't know where it was going to go and so there'd be times he'd call me up and he's like okay i think i might have your character killed because he's such a sleaze bag <laughs> no i think i want the earth to be destroyed and for everybody to meet up in space with Hightower and Dylan and all of those people, but it'd be like Carmen Kyandra, Jillian G, John Dane, and Carlson having to work together instead of kill each other because basically they're the only people left on this like planet that's been overrun and now they're out in space in a tin can or something like that. Wow. <laughs> well, I do think, I think it's, it's classic bill in this script because if you look at it it's his classic use of intercutting or cross cutting yes mm -hmm. right between between the three stories you've got the space story so you've got everybody who's on the asimov 
three, and you've got the president, and, and Mark Olson, I thought, was fabulous in this. Yes, he was, uh, yeah. And uh, other people were, too, but and Joe Stofko, who I think is good in anything, yep. uh, I thought was great, too. But the, but the thing is, is that then you've got the, all the, you know, the political stuff happening on, on Earth, and then you've got all of that shadow government thing with Carlson and Dane and, and all that happening. So you had those three stories concurrently happening and cutting back and forth, and like you said last week, Jack, it was flawlessly edited so that you just moved from one piece to another with kind of a, each one had its leitmotif, you know, yep. and, and moving through it. And, and it was just genius the way that he did it. And of course, he loved, loved those commercials for the football and the sham wow. Sham wow. You know, Thanks and, a lot for that, Bo Booyah! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're good at that. You know, he loved putting in those commercials and because and, he loved popular culture so much in that way and putting that all in there. And it just, it was this great mix of working through that script in a, in a kind of a cross-cutting, intercutting type of a way. It kind of made me feel like Robocop, you know, where they throw in those commercials in Robocop, and it's a good way to cut between scenes. Yep. There's um, a couple of things going on there that, that Bill and I would talk about. One, this is just a fun little Easter egg, was that since I played both the uh, Sham Zhao Pitchman and Carlson, Bill was going to write in at some point that the uh, Pitchman was kind of like the slightly damaged, maybe mentally damaged, uh, twin brother. Yeah. Of Carlson. <laughs> but this was a secret, and that Carlson was going to basically ha had kept trying to hide this, and he got him the only job that he could actually do, which was to sing really badly and do this like over the top pitch. And that something was happening because in all those commercials about the uh, asteroid Am I Licious, then it's like, oh, and now there's the added thing of the Shamzow hunk is going to be there. Well, it was going to be actually. Because he had probably, you know, really upset the wrong people or gotten himself into trouble again. And it's like, we've got to put him on the asteroid or else everything's going to fall apart. <laughs> Things are going to come out. So this was kind of him actually being exiled or something like that. See, but that's so great because he was able to bring in that humor mm -hmm. as well. At the same time, he did what he always did so well, I thought, was raising the stakes in in all of the other stories. Yeah. Yep. So so whether it was, you know, you know, with, with uh, Captain Pike and it was his fiance who, who died on Asimov too, or at least that's what they think. You know, and then with the alcoholism and, you know, the pension over his head and all the raising of the stakes for all the characters like your character Lothar, the conflict with Doctor Dane, you know what I mean? It, he he was just so good at these layered plots and mm -hmm. just yeah. raising the stakes and building the conflict, which you guys know is so important in these stories. Is, oh is yeah. It, that of that conflict without conflict there is no drama unless you're unless you're Beckett you know what yeah. I mean you know, so, <laughs> and I love Beckett so but the thing is he was just so good at that and then he would mix in yeah. the comedy parts like, and it's Amanda Fitzwater yeah oh yeah Fitzwater <laughs> yeah played Jillian G right yeah Jillian G uh, oh you god know, that, that whole scene that he mixed he just mixed to death it was so awesome oh, god. <laughs> where she's throwing the vase at me and I'm like being dumped my underwear that has to be one of the most fun scenes to record and then to hear afterwards because he did such an amazing job yeah what's the line have some respect for the ming <laughs> yeah something like that that's uh, right yeah I, I laugh every time i hear you okay. say that have some respect for the <laughs> yeah that is great when, when you were talking about the, the humor of the commercials and robocop that ties into some other conversation phil and i had which is around a lot of the, the 80s and early 90s and a lot of the satire that was funny incredibly big and dark at the same time and a lot of uh howard Ch like howard chicken's american flag right. 2109 the, the use of the tools the media cutting back and forth which you know uh Chaykin also then influenced frank miller the way that he did the similar sort of thing with sure. dark Knight returns you know other things in there that that was really the zeitgeist of the time and that was you know a huge time period for bill visually artistically as well as narratively so i think there's a little bit of that dna in there oh, as well you're absolutely right i never thought of that that's really cool yeah i know for me i'm sitting there listening going well where did that intro voice come from and then i realized I was, that would be you jack would, that's you no, jack. I mean, <laughs> the, the, why did i why did i use that accent and then i realized the accent was because i was really annoyed that i didn't get to do the introduction to the battlestar galactica narration oh. and so i was trying to oh. aim that uh <laughs> because i <laughs> really wanted to, I love that. I would sit there and say the Battlestar Galactica narration myself as a little kid over and over and over again. The other actor in there that was had their first time was actually Ginny. Yes, so she, you're right. Was, That's right. She was like just yep. off the bus basically almost and, and, and was here and he said, do you want to be in this? And she's like, I, I don't speak a whole lot of English. She spoke fine.
fine, but she was always nervous about it. So she got to play Phoenix 69. She didn't blow everything up the right way. She, she missed her assassination. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Yes, yeah, she yeah. did. I'm, I'm, Carlson's still very upset about that. <laughs> but, but you should you should see, like, for the next week afterwards, she would say, because he was saying, you know, can you do this in a very sexy way? That's the way she was saying. So she would walk around the apartment going, I'm Phoenix 69 doing the dishes in a very sexy way. <laughs> <laughs> everything was in a very sexy way for a week. And I had no problem with that. I just want to say that very clearly, that there was I, absolutely no issue with that. So. <laughs> in preparation for this, I, I listened to the three episodes that Bill had finished mm -hmm. again, and then I read the rest of the episodes. I, I have up through uh, episode six mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, and perhaps, uh, yeah, and because I was curious, I hadn't read them in so long because it, it came out in 2013, I think, maybe late 2012. Yes. Yeah, is when it actually came out, and I've listened to it so many times because I love it. Mm -hmm. But I reread it, and it was interesting to see where he was going and, and to to see the actual how he even layered it more and more and more and how the stories were starting to come together a little bit more mm -hmm. how he was such such a good writer in the fact that you know they're going to blow up the sentinel that's out there but if they do that they don't know it but if they do that it's going to cause destruction of the earth mm -hmm. yeah. you know what i mean it was that dramatic irony that he had in there mm -hmm. you know that's happening that as a listener you knew because you you heard the other conversations you know but Captain Pike doesn't know, and like that, and they're going to do it, and they make the deal with the Tarak, who's the villain, you know, in, in the later ones. And I, I, I would love to have seen where I, where it was going to go, because it was uh, it was going in a tremendous arc. Did he have, like, a, a how many a number of episodes that he was going to use, or was it, do you know if it was a continual sh series, or just one that he wanted to finish? It's hard to say with Bill, I bet. He was going to, oh. one, finish up this initial arc, which was six, you know, six episodes, and he had all of the Dylan Pike stuff written already, but what he did not have written was all the subplot stuff on Earth and the way that was all going. That he hadn't uh, nailed down. After that, all I know is that he was going to do at least another arc, if not a, an arc after that, to sort of go, and I think he was just sort of, like, enjoying the ride. He didn't know where it was going to end up. He just enjoyed, he was going to enjoy the ride until it got to where it needed to be. I can corroborate that, because I had read an email that he had sent me about that, and he did say that he had the space stuff done, but then and he had this idea of, of taking it. So he had at least another arc kind of planned in his mind, you know, that he was going to do, whether he knew what he was going to do. I, he never shared that with me. But my guess is that he was just kind of going, like Lothar said, he was just kind of going with the flow, yeah. you know, and writing My, it. my, my personal ending is that uh, Carlson takes over the universe. But that's <laughs> Well, that's a good point for us to be able to go and have everyone listen to the ride, too. But before that said, I had a re really big realization about Bill as a producer. And so I was thinking today that I've always said if Dirk Meggs is, is sort of like the Steven Spielberg of audio drama, then Bill Hallwig was absolutely audio drama's John Carpenter. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yep. He would yep. he would love that. He would love that. <laughs> have that name put on there. All right. So thanks so much for reminiscing about Bill with me and let's all listen to the show. The following audio drama is rated PG-13 for Pretty Gory. You may experience swearing, violence, and sexual situations that you engage in often, hopefully never, and only in your dreams. Parents need to watch your children. They could learn more than you want them to. Uh, they don't appear to be uh, having a entertainment is Black Sun Rising, an original science fiction audio drama. Episode 1. Man has reached the stars and colonized the solar system. Problems are set on the major governments of the world, on outposts beginning from the first research stations of the Earth's moon, stretching from Mercury to the Nord 1 colony on Pluto. The science of terraforming planets is in its infancy, 
and harsh worlds now have breathable atmospheres, and in some cases, vegetation has even started to take hold. Utilizing nuclear science as the first ships capable of FTL point one faster than light speed. In the year 2091, the Asimov-1 deep space probe was launched, but it never made it past the halfway point on man's first deep space mission to Alpha Centauri. Since then, two more ships have been built, the Asimov-2 and Asimov-3. In the year 2097, the Asimov-2 was launched and attempted the same trip to Alpha Centauri. The last reports and communication pods sent back to Earth from various points along the journey have been positive, as the Asimov-2 traveled farther than man has ever been in the cosmos. Yet for all these scientific advances, first contact has yet to occur. Man still believes he is the master of all that exists. This is about to change. We now join the Asimov 2 mission in the year 2101 AD. Solar Systems Colonies from Mercury to Pluto, back to the Solar NFL's premier game day and 3D pre-game show live on Earth. And here's the football's Venus, Jillian G in her intra-Solar System game day weather forecast. The Solar NFL League. <laughs> this is Jillian G and my weather romp. First up, game one of our doubleheader, we cruise out to Mars. Check out the 3D graphics as I show off the latest bikini and my new Skimpy Sports apparel line. The weather forecast for the Martian Maulers is a red dust storm. Yep, as if that's a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jillian. This is Carmen Kayendra coming from Washington, D.C. 
sorry to interrupt today's bone-crushing solar football grudge match between the Titans and the Maulers, but sources tell me that El Presidente has called an emergency security council meeting at the White House. Even Admiral Veers is in attendance. I wonder what's going on up there to bring in all the top brass. After all, things that make you go, hmm. Anyway, the Solar News Corps will keep on top of the story as it breaks for you, our awesome audience. We now return you to the Titans and the Maulers after a word from the Shamzao hunk. Mm -hmm. This is Carmen Kayandra keeping an eye on the news and the slinky in fashion. If you had a Shamzao, you'd get rid of all the death that ever came into your life. Ooh, yeah, that Shamzao in 1995. Put a sham now on your silver credit card and get a second shams out for free. Booyah! All day long you'd clean and clean and clean if you had a shams out. Booyah! Attention on deck. President arriving. Thank you, Staff Sergeant. As you were. Joint Chiefs, Security Advisors. Okay. I have a meeting scheduled with the United Nations this afternoon. Press conference is scheduled in about an hour. Admiral Beers, what is the situation? Mr. President, as you have seen in the security briefs today, uh, we've received a transmission. Uh, make that the final transmission from the Asimov II. Yes, that's what I gathered from the reports earlier. Hmm. Having received zero status reports for the past year from the space pods, the Asimov II was supposed to have been sending back every month in light of the evidence contained in a... <coughs> Transmission of unknown origin. The Asimov II is now officially categorized as destroyed. That's the long and short of the situation, correct? Yes, sir. Hmm. First off, do we have any reason to believe this transmission was a hoax? Failing that, and assuming the information is correct, that this incident could possibly be a terrorist attack. An act of sabotage, perhaps. No, sir. And it wasn't the Russians, the Chinese, or any of our allies. Hmm. I assume the CIA and her sister arm, the Solar OSS, have confirmed this beyond a shadow of a doubt, then? Aye, sir. Hmm. Like the Asimov one? Aye, sir. Then, I hesitate to phrase it this way, but I have to know, was it... First contact, sir? Uh, I don't like it either. But the evidence supports this conclusion. Okay. Okay. I assume the evidence you refer to is the transmission in question. Aye, sir. Uh, Mr. President, allow me to turn this meeting of the Security Council over to Bob Dolan, head of NASA. He is far better equipped than this old sea dog to uh, answer your questions. Very well. Mr. Dolman, present your opinions on this and be brief. Yes, sir, Mr. President. With the distances involved between Alpha Centauri and the Earth, Add to that the fact that no other colonial outpost in the solar system received this transmission, it had to originate from an extraterrestrial source. A source utilizing a technology beyond that of any government on Earth. The wavelengths used for military and interplanetary communication could not have reached the Earth much less our mission control station in Houston and only our mission control center in Houston in so short a time. It would have taken years. Therefore, I must conclude that it was an intentional communique from who or for what purpose we have no clue at this time. The position points, ship data, and timeline, not to mention the actual real-time video feed from the Asimov 2 uploaded into the received transmission on Earth, were genuine. No country on Earth or the settlements throughout the solar system could have faked this transmission. I repeat, it was intentional and not... You positive the transmission was intentional and not of human origin? Yes, sir, Mr. President. And it was sent in a wavelength and by means that don't correspond to anything we know. Now, we still aren't really sure how we were able to get the transmission, much less understand it at all, if I must be frank about this. We have Dr. Rand to thank for that. She was the one that deciphered it upon receipt. And then second wave of transmission started, but even with Dr. Rand's assistance, we have been unable to decipher them. Very well. So we have first contact. Oh, the dangling, frozen shitball and the ass crack of the solar system. Oh, 
Shot terraform, oh, grad. Heat this rock. I could use a tan. Funny, Dylan. Damn gloves. Ugh, coffee. Need coffee now. Trust me, if I have an epiphany, this whole damned rock's gonna make Cabo San Lucas seem like Canada, complete with very sexy cabana boys to oil me to perfection. Damn, it's cold here, too. Right. I'll buy the first Mai Tai and get you a pink umbrella. Is the perimeter okay? Yeah, cold and frozen. As if anything changes on this rock. Oh, come to Mama Java! Ah, what? Ah. It should be perfect for the first mission outside our solar system. Wish I was... Okay, there. thanks for doing the sweep. Ah. This is Pluto Launch Control, Dylan speaking. Perimeter is clear, mission green. I repeat, the mission is green. Do you copy, Asimov 3? Copy that, Solar 1 Control. See you back here on 6 in a few years on the flight back. We copy mission and go, Commander of Asimov 3, over. Copy that, Commander. Safe trip and, uh, good hunting for the lost ones. Keep the home fires burning, Pluto Bay. Still find Asimov 2. Commander Adam Winkler, as of all three. I so should be on that mission to Elf. Stuck in that hunk of junk for four years? Not me. I'd rather have this cushy desk job any day, my friend. Cushy desk job? Here? Pluto? Oh, my God, are you... It's so cold on this rock, the terraformed atmosphere has the consistency of gravy <laughs> on Thanksgiving. Oh, maybe so, Sarah, but it sure beats the hell out of being stuck in a cold metal star probe hurtling through the cosmos at point one past the speed of light to who knows what. Not to mention the living conditions on a star trip. Ever been in one of those probes? You gotta go on a spacewalk just to change your mind. <sighs> Damn. My only vice these days, and I need a refill. Here, let me... Thanks. You smoke too much, Dylan. Apollo missions were spacious compared to those things. <laughs> and I only smoke after the evening meal. Thank you very much, Mother. Anything has to be better than this, Uncle Vice. Oh, I want Cabana Boys. Cabana Boys and sushi. Two sugars, creamer. Here, it's hot. Thanks. Practically the only thing that is hot on this shitball. It's still not good for you, Dylan. Lots of things aren't good for a person, but trust me. It's better here than out there in one of those metal death traps. Even with the cold here. I was on Asimov 1. We almost didn't make it back. <laughs> you were on Asimov 1? I read about it while doing my thesis for my master's. The Academy? <laughs> oh god, I'm getting old. I should have put two and two together. What really happened? You really want to know, huh? Reactor in the engine core blew right after passing the halfway point. Shit. Where's my... Aha. Dylan, you can't smoke inside the complex. Write me up then, Sarah. Wouldn't be the first time I got called in front of the board. Anyway, we coasted for two years till they were able to get us. Food running out. Crew of ten living in a box smaller than this command center here. Half were mad. One went cannibal. I had to put him down with my bare hands. Permanently. Came back a crew of seven. Two eaten, one strangled, the rest malnourished and close to death or insanity. Government covered that bit up. There was an appropriations meeting of Congress right about then. They couldn't lose their funding. Oh no. Gotta reach the stars. Gotta roll more pork into the bill rather than spend bucks on building a better starship. 
or scrapping the whole first contact idea. Then we lose contact with Asimov 2. My fiance was the captain on that damn Asimov 2 flight. Jesus! Jesus don't make FTL jumps, my young friend. Trust me. Nothing out there in the dark of the spaceways. But hell. Never catch me in another one of those death traps. Anyway. I could have gone after her. Hell, I was offered the captain's chair on the Asimov 3. But I knew what I'd find, so I... Shit. Enough ancient history. Guess we gotta get this probe up and away from the gas station. Maybe they can... Maybe they can do what I can't. Or won't. Wentworth, for all his bullshit and ego, he's a good pilot. He's just an asshole. Sarah, can you grab me that... What's that? Incoming transmission. From Earth. Weird. They must have sent that a couple hours ago for it to reach us out here. Yeah. Let's see what they want. This is Director Carlson, Solar OSS Director by Order of the President. Nord One Colony, Commander Pike. I pray this message is received prior to Asimov 3 launch. Abort Mission Alpha. I repeat. What? Abort Mission Alpha. Asimov 3 is grounded until further notice. Why? Asimov 2 transmission was received minutes ago Earth time. What? First They're... contact. They're alive? They all died. Oh my god. Jesus. And this is for Pike. Remember the non-disclosure. Jesus. Just to keep this straight in my head, the first contact destroyed the Asimov 2 deep space probe. And now we have a second set of unknown transmissions that only our Houston mission control is capable of receiving. Gentlemen, in light of this evidence, and as much as I hate to say it, I'm going to have to ground all interstellar flights in the solar system, accepting transports for priority life-sustaining supplies. The economy's going to tank, my approval ratings are going to spiral down, and the radio talk show hosts are going to have fodder for years. The public's going to be screaming for my head. But until we know more, I don't see it any other way. Which brings me to the next question. The Asimov 3 was awaiting launch on Pluto. He's going to go out and search for the Asimov 2. You did stop that launch, correct? Yes, sir, Mr. President. It was close, and the final countdown was nearing ignition, but Nord 1 Mission Control aborted it in time. Good. Well, you all realize we do have to send out the Asimov 3 out there. We have to know what's going on in space. It could be a science fiction nightmare invasion. It could be anything. The security of the Earth depends on this. They may not return. Am I correct in my analysis? Aye, sir. Yes, sir. What about the Asimov 3? Is she armed? No, sir. It, like the Asimov 1 and the Asimov 2 before her, is a research vessel. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Veers, as much as I hate to say this, and trust me, my Democrat base is going to hate me for this. I think we need to arm the Asimov 3. Aye, sir. I know it'd take too long to construct a Dreadnought-class Warbird as a now. No, I'm aware. We have one under construction already. How soon could a refit of the Asimov 3 be accomplished? Oh, I agree, Mr. President. And yes, we will have our first military aircraft carrier ready for launch from our Apollo base on the moon in about a year and a half. As to the Asimov 3 refit, I just so happen to have a contingency plan awaiting your approval. Here, my report. Give me two months. I can swing equipment from Ceres Station in the asteroid belt and grab personnel from our Titan base off Saturn, which will also cut down on transport time to Pluto for the refit. We also have a Spec Ops outpost on Pluto, which will volunteer some troops for the Asimov 3 mission. Also, uh, Mr. Goldman here has offered to lend some tech support from the NASA Research Facility orbiting Uranus to expedite the refit of the Asimov 3. Very well. Here, and this one, We're done. Here, Admiral Pierce. Signed. Mr. Dolman, before we adjourn from this meeting, the crew of the Asimov 3, uh, I'm assuming they're all experienced in intra solar system flight. Uh, yes, Mr. President. All have made the colonial outpost runs throughout the solar system. Are any of them experienced outside the solar system? were any a part of the initial short-range probe missions around the rim about a decade ago. <clears throat> um, no, sir. Why is that? 
it would seem to me prudent on a mission of this magnitude experience would be the utmost concern. Well, Mr. President, most of those astronauts have retired or no longer meet mission requirements for space piloting. Hmm. Most, you say? There is one. Who? <clears throat> Pilot Dylan Pike. Pike? The Dylan Pike? The same Pike who was given the Medal of Honor for getting the crew of the Asimov One back alive? Where is he, and why isn't he a part of this mission? Mr. President, <clears throat> he refused to fly again. This was before the alien transmission. Then he was <clears throat> demoted from the space program to Mission Control Head on Pluto. Pike is on Pluto? Mission Control Head on Pluto is being tantamount to sent out to pasture. Other than the recent Asimov missions, nothing of note beyond supply transports makes it out that far. Not often at that. I used to make those runs when I played for the Saturn Titans. <laughs> that was years ago. I digress. Mr. Dolman, why in God's name was Pike demoted and hung out to dry? He started having problems with... with alcohol. And rather than kick him out of the service, in light of all of his accomplishments, he was given the option of the Nord 1 base on Pluto, or being fired without pension. Fired without pension? His wife was the captain of the Asimov II. He's still competent, though. No, fully, sir. But I don't You're think You're not here to think, Mr. Dolman. You're here to advise. Make him the captain. Give him a, his pick of the crew. Whoever he trusts. But... Sir, he refuses to ever fly again. Not to mention that when he's not sober, he's a hazard to himself and others. He's a fifth degree black belt, for God's sake. And when Pike drinks, he drinks and he gets angry. And the next thing you know, he puts people in ICU and usually they're shore patrol and high ranking officials. That's enough, Mr. Dolman. I take it you ended up in ICU? Yes. Hand me a service jacket. Now? Yes, Mr. President. Here. Hmm. As bad as this is, I've seen worse. And I think that I... Yeah, I, I can make Mr. Pike see the light of day in view of all the documented infractions. Make him a deal he can't refuse. Admiral Veers. Get the Air Force One shuttle fueled up. After my summit with the UN, I want to meet Pike personally. Aye, sir. Mr. President, if you're going down this path, you have to know... What do I have to know, Mr. Dolman? I would recommend at least a few technicians and or a pilot from the current Asimov 3 crew on Pluto to be added to Pike's crew. Though, they're not going to be happy about their crew being scrubbed from the scheduled mission. Happy's not a concern of mine, Mr. Dolman. The security of the Earth and its colonies throughout the solar system is. But you do have a point. I want Pike to handpick his crew to make him feel comfortable. Well, I'll grant you two members of the current crew. Captain Wentworth and uh, his second-in-command, Rochelle, I think, if memory serves. Mr. President... Just to have a backup in case Mr. Pike somehow finds a bar in deep space and goes on a binge. But drop Wentworth and Rochelle in rank so that the whole crew knows Pike is the captain. Well, they're not going to like that. Pike, Wentworth, and Rochelle have a, a history. Wentworth is the one that turned Pike in. Then it'll keep Pike on his toes and hopefully on the straight and narrow. This meeting's adjourned. <clears throat> Veers, after my press conference, see to it the shuttle of Pluto is ready. Aye, sir. You have my word. Attention on deck. Good day, gentlemen. President departing. And with the intergalactic shams out, your transport will shine like new, even after a transit to the Ceres colony in the asteroid belt. That sham's out. Only 1995. Put a sham now on your solar credit card and get a second sham's out for free. We're gonna throw in a transit air freshener to hang from your control panel. Booyah! Booyah! 
Hey gang, Jillian G and my weather Rob. Check out the 3D graphics and my tan. The weather forecast for the Cloud Minded 2 colony on Venus is, you guessed it, humid with neon green clouds rolling in later in the day. Now, follow the 3D graphic over to the Vogue Stadium and check out this new pressure system building here to the south. Perfect home field advantage for the Valkyries. So keep those infrared filters on if you're going to be at the game later today. And you guys know how much I love me some Venusian Valkyries and that defense. I'm going to take my Valk and their Blitz and D over Euro Team, the Titan Grinders, Teray. The Grinders rushing attack won't be able to hold up to the Volks home stadium and that gravity differential, not to mention those Venusian clouds, Teray. <laughs> And you know how much we love those out-of-system weather reports, Jillian G, in your Sola NFL bikini. Only $19.95, and you too could squeeze into that too, folks. Sorry, got to plug Jillian in that bikini. Just cruise over to nflsolar.com forward slash solar. But my boys from the Titan colony are going to run all over the Valkyries. Gravity differential or no gravity differential, Jillian G. <laughs> I never worried about no gravity differential when I played. <laughs> Shoot, I can't even spell gravity differential. Hold on, Terry. <laughs> what? Oh, our producer says the president's going to make an all-nation speech. So, we now send you over to our bureau in Washington. We'll bring you back to game day after this press conference. Chili and G, great tan and awesome bikini. Carmen Kayandra here at the White House. The year is 2101 and it's off with a bang. And I'm not talking about the global warming and the 80 degree temperatures in December or the ageless Chili and G and her awesome bikini. I must have find out what her secret is because between you and me, my lovely listeners, no 80 year old can look like that. But she is Chili and G, beloved by all on the Solar Reality TV. Where was I? Oh yes, the White House and breaking news. Things are really making me go, hmm. First a Security Council meeting, and now El Presidente has called for an emergency press conference in reference to the lost Asmog 2 manned space probe. It should be coming out in about... This is Press Secretary. Oh, Mr. Press Secretary! The President will explain everything now. Please be seated. The United States Space Authority, Terror Command 1, here on Earth, received the final transmission from Space Probe Asimov 2, launched four years ago. The Asimov 2 was two months away from being the first manned starcraft from the Earth to orbit another star. It never made it. The brave captain, Danny Bird, and her gallant crew all perished after making first contact with something. Of what or who, we only know that the ship was obliterated. As to any further speculation, we will not be entering into that at this time or this place. I know this is hard to believe, but it's the cold, hard truth. The Asma 2 is gone. There is another race in our universe beyond mankind. As to why this last message of the Asma 2 was broadcast directly to our Earthbound Mission Control Station, we have no clue. The transmission was not received by our outpost on Pluto, the Nord 1 colony, which was in the process of assisting in the launch of the deep space of Asma 3 to search for the missing Asma 2. That mission has been grounded, pending an inquiry into the Asma 2 catastrophe. None of our other colonies in the solar system have received this transmission, nor have the Russians, British, or Chinese colonies either. Make no mistake, this was first contact with an unknown and apparently hostile alien race. 
This was a warning. Therefore, until we know more, all spaceships, except for essential transports to our colonies throughout the solar system, have been grounded until further notice by my executive order. This decree has also been ratified by the United Nations Space Charter. There will be a memorial service held Sunday to honor our fallen heroes. That's all I can say. This is Carmen Cayandra keeping an eye on the news and the slinky in fashion. Fears. It's Director Carlson's, if you didn't know. Look, it's 2103, and no Dreadnought, and no launch of the Asimov 3. Brand new year, and no starships ready. Why? I don't give a good goddamn if you are head of the Joint Chiefs. As you are well aware, I hold the same rank as head of the CIA and Solar OSS. Not to mention, I have other means at my disposal if you piss me off. Whatever. And yeah, I am going to replace Jillian. Again. I couldn't give a shit what you think about replicant tanks. She is the voice of the solar NFL, and by proxy, my best source for molding public perception. And each has been very good in the sack. What of it? Why the hell do you care, Beers? Mind control, reality TV, and solar core. So what? Because of me, we've avoided World War III, as well as the erosion of freedom. A taxation rate that would be horrific if it were not so downright criminal, not to mention your daughter was cured of the newest strain of cancer last month. And in case you forgot, your son before that... I moved her to the front of the line, Beers, just like I did for your son. <coughs> you owe me. Or did you forget that? Good. Somehow Pike has kept his word and his alcohol consumption within reason. And the president only knows what we want him to know. Yeah, I still have neglected to mention that extraterrestrial forensics on the Asimov 1 engine failure and resulting explosion, which leads to the A2 going kaboom. And now Pike commanding the A3? I'm good like that. Just get the Asimov 3 ready. Shit. The Asimov 3 is ready to launch this week, and you forgot to add me to that memo as well. Shit. <laughs> Let me understand this. We've been tearing at each other's throats for the past five minutes. Over the vid phone. Just for your own amusement. You're an asshole, you know that, Veers? But a damn good admiral, I have to admit. And you know who your friends are. Do you really think I'd be talking like this if the line wasn't secure? You do your part, and I'll do mine. Your daughter will have her mansion in Aspen, and the cancer will be gone for good. Get the dreadnought ready, Admiral, and launch the damned Asimov III, and we are golden. Oh, you're welcome. Good day, His order, our asses. You said you wanted to go up in that thing. Now's your chance. 
I can't believe I'm doing this. We're gonna make history! Correct. The second statistic in the coming alien invasion. You don't know it was an invasion. Oh, maybe the Asimov 2 flew too close and it startled the aliens. And they were trying to protect- My fiance died out there because of those- Christ, we don't even know what they are. I... I'm sorry. Look, this is for real, Sarah. I have a sick feeling in my gut about this. And here we go. Off to get into the alien targeting sites. Hell, no one's even tracked down whatever did that to Asimov, too. Just the message out there. Transmitting the crew's final breath over and over. Danny Bird. My Danny. Captain of that death trap. And then they send us on this mission after scrapping it in every other flight. Dylan, you're the only one with experience out there. Yeah. Lucky me. You wanted to see the damn stars. Let's get on with it. At least the military sent a few Spec Ops guys along for the ride and made some armament upgrades to the Asimov 3. Military? Upgrades? Armament? I knew Terra Command were refitting the living quarters, but what? Oh, well, this ain't just a science mission anymore. T-minus two minutes and counting until main reactor fire on Asimov Dane, this is Director Carlson. Just stop. Stop. Doctor, let me get to the point. The subject in replicant tank 7013A. Yes, Mary Veer's Alpha-1 is her designation. Yes, it is who you think it is. Doctor, I don't give a damn what you think. Don't forget, I have been telescans of you and those underage... You do remember. Then no need to release them to Carmen Kyandra for the time being, if you follow my orders. We understand each other, correct? Good. Excellent. Here's what I need you to do, Doctor. Bring subject 70138 to consciousness. I will have... <laughs> the recuperating Mary Fears delivered to your lab via military airlift from Naval Air Station Clinton at 1900 hours or so. Bandage Mary Veer's Alpha One's head to match the incoming Mary Veer's and send the clone back to Naval Air Station Clinton. You have no worries on this one. Your hands are mostly clean. Mostly. <laughs> My men will handle the subtlety of the transfer and Admiral Veer's will chalk up any inconsistencies from the Alpha One as cancer recovery. What do you think I want you to do with his real daughter? Dispose of her. You heard me. Or do I call Kayandra? Good. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, one more thing. The brainwashing positronic implants. They're functioning at 100% capacity now. Good. I'll be in touch soon. All day long you'd clean and clean and clean If you had a sham sound Ooh yeah! The liquid hydrogen vent valve has been closed and flight pressurization is underway T-minus one minute, fifty seconds and counting T-minus one minute, twenty seconds and counting We can see the purges of the main engines uh, as we prepare for ignition Minus one minute. It has been armed. T minus 45 seconds and counting. All systems checked out okay. I repeat, we are a go for liftoff, Nord 1. Good luck! Copy that. You 
you ready, Sarah? <laughs> I've been waiting my whole life for this moment. There is a God. Glory, hallelujah. Right. I hope you're right. And I hope we don't long for Pluto. For the record, all systems go. Starting the final launch sequence. Engine room. Ray. Hey, fire her up. We're a go. Find thrusters now, Captain. God be with us. Yeah. Grease monkeys get up here? Sure, Dylan. Be up in five. What's up? Course change. Dylan, out. Course change? What's going on, Dylan? Yeah. I've been pouring over the last transmissions from the Asimov 2 for the past two years we've been in flight on this tin can, and I think I found something. Just before the uh, final communication from my fiance. Captain Danny Bird mentioned weird transmissions coming from somewhere near Alpha Centauri. So I did some thinking, and enlisted our navigator and some of you others in making a few calculations. So that's why you had me transcribing all the statistics on asteroids and the availability of terraforming them. <laughs> I thought you were just curious. Yeah, I am. But not for what you're thinking. I'll let the navigator explain. John? Thanks. Okay, Dylan had this idea based on the fact that across great distances, as you all know, communication signals do not travel at the speed of light. Which is why every month or two, for the past two years, we send out FTL comm pods back to Earth to status report. Great. You know, even us military grunts know that. Two years cooped up in this tin can with nothing to frag. So what? Listen to the man, Sergeant. Aye, sir. Thanks. Anyway. The final transmission from the Asimov 2 here reached the Earth in near record time as far as everyone studying it in the Defense Department could ascertain and was targeted specifically for our United States program in Florida. Dr. Rand, maybe you should take over here. Thank you, John. That transmission was beamed on a wavelength that was beyond top secret. How did it get here? The Asimov 2 had no communications arrays capable of that nor do we know how that is even possible. It was done intentionally, but by who or what? I was able to decipher the transmission itself, which led to us all being here. That's our mission now, finding the source of the transmission. As the captain mentioned earlier, before the final message of the Asimov 2, strange transmissions were being picked up by the crew itself, but they were unintelligible though definitely a language from an intelligent species, from Alpha Centauri, as far as we can ascertain. Though we have no idea if they originated from Alpha Centauri, 
or were coming from further out because of some other collected data and their wavelengths, as you can now see on screen. Scientific bullshit and ancient history lessons. So? Sergeant. I sir. What you don't know, and was kept secret, was that the extraterrestrial transmissions originally picked up by the Asimov II started being picked up by the Terra-1 command on Earth shortly after the demise of Asimov II. Wait, back up, what? Then they too stopped. Say again? John? Yeah, they had stopped till about three weeks ago and then we started picking them up. Really? Yes. I've been a little leery all along about using the same flight path as the Asimov II anyway. It just seemed too much like we were being fed into a pending alien meat grinder. So I got to thinking, based on the makeup of those comm waves, they had to have communication outposts, the beings that is. Even granting that they have superior technology, these transmissions were still radio waves and physics laws can only be bent so much. After conferring with Dr. Rand, as I am far from being an astrophysicist, she agreed. So I asked the navigator to try and triangulate a fix on them if possible. He did, well, one of them to be precise, with some help from Dr. Rand. So here's what I propose. I plan to alter our flight path to intercept this outpost, a rogue asteroid. This will add a couple of months to the trip, but I think it's worth it. We have supplies for it. What do you think? Hey gang, Dylan, what did we miss? We're gonna change course and finally hunt some aliens. Payback's gonna be a bitch. What? entering the outer edge of its gravitational sphere. Jesus! What's wrong? This thing has near Earth G, but pow! Okay, that's this <laughs> unexpected. Is really, really. Sarah, what do you have? Hold on. Weird. What the? Okay, that's just weird. Weird ain't a technical term, Sarah. What are you reading? It's got an atmosphere. And... Holy shit. I don't believe this. It's close to Earth. On an asteroid in the middle of nowhere. God help me, I may have been right. Oh, I thought you said God wasn't watching over spacers, Dylan. Funny. John, fire the stationing thrusters. Let's get a closer look. Are you sure? Do it. Okay. Changing course to 175. BSR Black Sun Rising Episode 1 Written, mixed, and produced by Bill Holway The cast for tonight's episode The opening narrator, Jack Ward Asimov 3, Space Probe Crew Dylan Pike was Matthew Weller Sarah Shields was Elaine Barrett Adam Wentworth was Glenn Sheets Ray Milano is Chip Joel John Hightower, Jeff Villard Dr. Melanie Rand, Kim Giannopoulos, Sergeant Jane Hillsberg, 
Tanya Milosevic, Asimov 2 Space Probe Crew, Captain Danny Bird, Alex Chipman, Lieutenant Mick McBride, David Krauss, Commander Willie Rand, W. Ralph Walters, Pluto Base, Launch Controller 1, W. Ralph Walters, Launch Controller 2, Tanya Milosevic, Launch Controller 3, Bill Holway, Earthcast, Agent Carlson, Lothar Tuppen, President of the USA, Mark Olson, President Press Secretary, Michael Hudson, Admiral Veers, Joe Sofko, Bob Dolman, Seth Adam Shear, Marine, Paul Lavelle, Solar NFL announcer, W. Ralph Walters, Jillian G., Amanda Fitzwater, Sham Zhao Pitchman, Lothar Tuppen, Terry, Paul Lavelle, Carmen Kayandra, Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard, and as the journalists, Kyra Greenfield, Draven Schoberg, Brian Bokikio, Charlene Harris, Charles Miller, Rick Austin, Stephen K. Farnaby, Kath Donovan, and Carrie Ayers. Music used by permission, Brian Bokikio of War Horse Audio, Thomas of Oakman's Dreamland, and the Celestial Aeon Project. This has been a Broken Sea Audio production, and I am Brent Flynn Jensen Woodward of Gypsy Audio. Have a good evening. The following audio drama is rated R for Rockin'. You can be sure that everything you wanted to see when you're a teenager is here. Just tantalizingly out of reach if you're under 17 or 18 years old. Uh, they don't appear to be, uh, this is a look at a audio production where entertainment is always free. Entering the outer edge of its gravitational sphere. Jesus. What's wrong? This thing has near Earth G, but ow. Okay. That's this <laughs> unexpected. Is really, really. Sarah, what do you have? Hold on. Weird. What the? Okay, that's just weird. Weird ain't a technical term, Sarah. What are you reading? It's got an atmosphere. And holy. Oh, I don't believe this. It's close to Earth. On an asteroid in the middle of nowhere. God help me, I may have been right. Oh, I thought you said God wasn't watching over spacers, Philip. Funny. John, fire the stationing thrusters. Let's get a closer look. Are you sure? Do it. Okay. Changing course to 175.
Broken Sea Audio Productions presents 2109 Black Sun Rising, an original science fiction audio drama. Episode 2 In the year 2091, the Asimov 1 deep space probe was launched, but it never made it past the half world, a man's first deep space mission to Alpha Centauri, and barely made it back home. Since then, two more ships have been built, the Asimov 2 and Asimov 3. In the year 2097, the Asimov 2 was launched and attempted the same four-year trip to Alpha Centauri, until it was destroyed by an unknown extraterrestrial force. This contact has occurred, and in the case of the Asimov 2, it was fatal. Dylan Pike, the new part of the Asimov 3, believes he is going to rectify this and avenge his fiancée, Danny Bird, who perished on the Asimov 2. Two years into the Asimov 3's voyage and following the same trajectory as the Asimov 2, Pike came to a decision to alter the course of the Asimov 3 after uncovering a possible clue to the destruction of the Asimov 2. A clue located on a rogue asteroid halfway to Alpha Centauri. We now join the Asimov 3's mission on Asteroid Alpha. The year now, 2107 AD. View screens inoperable. At least the auxiliary systems are still functioning. I can see that. Well, we're on this rogue now and alive for what it's worth. John, see if you can get the power up and running. Is everyone okay? No major damages. Uh, minor structural issues, but <sighs> nothing vital. We can fix it in a few hours if we want or leave them be. Yeah. I'm just Peachy, thanks for asking, boss. Powers recycling now. Good. Might as well get on it. But, but who or what did this? You wanted to go spacer, Sarah. Here's your golden opportunity. Guess we all go find out now. Powers coming online now. Forward viewport online. Opening. Damn! Wait! Filter it, will ya? Filtering. There. Why didn't we see that that glowing tower pylon thing? I, why didn't we see it on approach? We were on the dark side, I guess, or who or whatever dragged us down here turned it on after we touched down. Great. Well, no time like the Should present. Should we still have Cabana Boys down on that planet? Because I could really go for some Cabana Boys. And cocktails. <coughs> John, get the Spec Ops gang ready. And have them bring their new toys. Gotcha. So, now we're going to go frag everything on this road. Only if it deserves it, assuming there are living things to frag. But, but first, before you get all high and mighty about my choice of command decisions, scan the asteroid. We need data. I may be the newbie around here, Dylan, but I didn't think we were... Then stop I, we, thinking. I, but, Start but I, scanning. We, you, That's an order. You, and from now on, uh, refer to me as the Captain, Henson. We're not military! We are now, by executive order. I captain this space probe. I am in charge. Remember that. <coughs> Scan. Yes, sir. It's... It's... It's shaped sort of like... Well, the best I can describe it is... Like the Rock of Gibraltar. But without the earth under it. 
Uh, the asteroid has four of these lighted pylons, I guess, for lack of a better term, that are spaced more or less like the points of a compass, lighting the plateau where we are. Uh, they are emitting an unknown energy, and they may also be the machinery behind the atmosphere and the vegetation. <coughs> vegetation? On an asteroid in deep space? Yes. <sighs> That's not purple mineral deposits under the ship, sir. There's some kind of grass. Purple. Purple grass? Vegetation, but weird. Blues, some green. Different species of it. Covering the lighted side of the asteroid. All the flat panes of it, and there's a stone. A stone okay. what? Scroll it down. Fabricated structures. It looks like a stone compound. Oldest time, yet new. It's hard to describe, and to get data, here, look. It's a cross between Stonehenge and the pyramids of all things. And there's other metallic structures farther off. Okay, well, but of a weird composition and spherical in shape. Let me see. See for yourself, Captain. It's been a bit lax as far as military bearing goes, what with the scientific types on board this boat. But what's at stake here, namely our lives, that ends now. I'm the captain of this ship. Everyone answers to me by order of the president. Period. So starting yesterday, we go by the book. Proper name and rank when addressing each other, the whole enchilada. Protocol will be observed from here on out. Period. Above time. That's enough, Sergeant. I. Dr. Rand. Thank you, Captain. There are structures out there, not crafted by the passages of time, but by sentient beings. We have been running tests on what information we've gathered up to this point, and have only come up with more questions. The atmosphere is breathable. Our terraformation specialist, Ensign Sarah Shields, has tested and retested it. Do you think they'll have Cabana Boys? I could really go for some Cabana Boys. <coughs> Ensign. Yes, sir. Dictators. <laughs> it's good to breathe. Gravity is close to that of the Earth's. How or why, again, no idea. This goes way beyond any terraforming tech that mankind has. This asteroid has been intentionally sculpted by a superior race. How or why? <laughs> Again, no idea. But we are going to go and find out. These are questions that need answers. As of now, we are stuck here due to, well, for lack of a better term, a tractor beam. Now, I know that sounds all science fiction, but right now, it's the reality. Our first objective, though, is to find the transmitters of the alien broadcasts, and in doing so, hopefully find a way off this rock. Spec Ops ready, Sergeant? Aye, Captain. Got the bikes loaded and the guns primed. Remember, this is a scouting mission, Sergeant. Do not, do not shoot first. You see anything alive, report back and set up a surveillance team. Understood? Aye. Good. I'd rather bag an alien. Get going. The rest of the crew will set camp around the ship and start taking readings to try and make sense of all this. Above all else, attention to detail. Be careful, we sure as hell ain't in Kansas anymore. tonight. I almost forgot, my dear audience. Do not forget to get those taxes paid before the 15th for the newest game show Solar Core hit, Pay or Flay, where deadbeat tax avoiders get strapped to an operating table and you, my lovely audience, gets to vote on what hot as medical student drops out to revisit their less than illustrious and as short I might add, med school practice of skin removal. 
Luma has it that the Swedish bikini team, as well as the jockey short physical stud, will be guest serving. Tune in next week. This is Carmen Kyandra keeping up to date with the things that make you go. Cut, that's wrap. Great job, Carmen. As always, might I add, you look fantastic. Lay one a slimy hand on me, Mark, and my Shamzel AK-97 purse vaporizes that space between your hips. Oh, wait, I, uh, no, no, I mean... I can't ask if you are the no, 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 second no cousin. Comprende? A step back and a shut it, amigo. Got me? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just, I, uh, oh, damn, forget the phone, I'm in here. Bendejo. You dropped your cell phone. Oopsie, did I just accidentally hit his most recent call list? Things that make you go, what? A picture from Carlson, and he's in bed with, why would he send a picture of us? Wait. That's not me. That's not... <laughs> no. My... My Carlson Wubby baby. My... My boyfriend with a... That's... <gasps> my... My Carlson Wubby baby. My, my boyfriend with a her. That sorry son of a... With a... With a jillion. You motherfucker. And oh, did you think you can get all huffity hump with jillion and Carmen and Kyandra won't find out? Sorry, green girl, golden, loving, sack of a guano, eating ass! <clears throat> Director Carlson speaking. Oh, boopsie, baby. Carmen, good to hear your voice, baby. But this is a government line, and I told you not to call me while I'm at work. You sorry son of a bitch! Am I interrupting you hiding the salami with Jillian Bendejo? You just boinked over the wrong news, goddess. I am going to expose you and all I know about. Please, Carl, what the fuck? Captain, the chem generators are up and running. Those pylons are giving off enough light to power the solar cells. So we're good to go here. My grease monkeys and me are going to get started on the repairs. Unless you need something else, sir. No, no, good. You did well. Go ahead, Ray. Lieutenant Ray Milano, sir. Shit. Right. Oh, jeez. Military protocol is harder than I thought, bud. Er, Lieutenant Milano. Been a long while since this old space dog was in basic. I'll keep you honest, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing that for years on Pluto, amigo. <laughs> Even if we weren't old friends, Captain, I'd still owe you to get me off that ice rock. <laughs> oh, man. On a more serious note, you still know that the original crew of the Asimov 3, the couple that are still part of this crew, aren't too happy about you replacing most of the crew with us. And the moat and the ones that remain. The former Captain Wentworth leads the malcontents? I just bet. Yeah, look, I heard them talking. And let's just say, they aren't ready to give you any special favors anytime soon. I'll try and watch them as best I can. But thought you might want a heads up. Thanks. I had to pick a crew that could do their jobs and one that I hopefully could trust. So far, I haven't heard anything. But the total lack of anything had my radar up anyway. I'll keep an eye out. Good. Well, I bet get started on the repairs. How if you get ready to check out those pylons, Captain? I'd love to tag along. You've got my word on that, Lieutenant. Ain't that the truth? Get up here, back on point. I want to swing back, check out our stick. Probably that's hard. 
you believe it? She actually got black. She, I don't think so. It's bombed them. Smoke anything funny and I'll kick your ass back to KP where I found you in the first place. Hey, uh, bombed them. Uh, copy that, Rod. Hey, uh, you still have to know. Hey, uh, look. I copy. Shit, that's what the captain wanted us to look at. It's big. It's big. Okay, cut the chatter. Cut the ride. We'll cut the four wheels and do it. I copy. This is the person over there where we can handle up and dump our ride. I copy. Time to lock and load. Lock and flag and rule. just locked the real daughter of Admiral Veers in cold storage in my lap, while the clone I made of her is with Veers himself. Carlson's gonna be the death of me. I need a drink. <sighs> oh, do shut up. Shit. I wonder what Carlson's been up to. Always good to have a backdoor hack on the solar CIA director's mainframe. Sometimes being a scientific genius in a multitude of disciplines does come in handy. <laughs> Shit, that sorry motherfucker. He recorded all our conversations, even the one about Veer's daughter. He can ruin me. Shit, shit, shit. Wait, Carlson, fucking asshole. If he's setting me up to jump off a short pier into shark infested waters to tidy his life up, you fucking asshole. I'm sure Miss Carmen Condra will love to know all about the genetic cloning of one Jillian G. Not to mention video of some more intimate entanglements the various clones have had with one Director Carlson. <laughs> now I hit send. Shit. Need another beer and while doing that, let's see what Miss Condra is up to. Oh, do shut up, or I'll get the whip out again, sweetheart. Miss Condra! Dr. Dane, scientific advisor to the Solar CIA, as well as One Director Carlson. I see you've discovered Mr. Carlson's transgressions with Jillian G. Actually, that's was, that was what I wanted to call you about. This might even be breaking news to be the lead story in your next newscast. Yes, it's about Jillian G. You are aware of the ban on genetic clones and the death penalty signed by all the nations of the Earth after what happened in the Middle East in 2052 and the nuclear crisis caused by the clone armies of the world? Wait, don't, don't hang up. Listen to me. And let me tell you about a program started by Director Carlson and his black operations budget. Have you ever wondered how Miss Jillian G and model and number one sportscaster of the solar NFL has never aged? You have. <laughs> Stay on the line. Check your inbox. I've just sent you something that will show you how dear old director Carlson has been using you while sleeping with a mind-altered clone. Jillian G. This is just too fantastic. I don't like it. Isn't that the truth? I don't trust anything this damn handheld's telling me. Pull up a chair. Drink? Sure. What's so fantastic now? Other than this 
possibly lush Garden of Eden. Funny way to phrase that. You know, Garden of Eden. Here. Thanks. <laughs> Jesus. When you said drink... Sorry. Helps me think, John. I thought you quit. I keep a few bottles for special occasions locked away. This... More than qualified. After the Asimov one, the inquiry, I went to a lot of trouble to back you on that. You need to watch it. And I am always going to be grateful. Look, I got back on track. Yeah, and got stuck with me on Pluto. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the leverage the president used to get you back on spacer status. <sighs> Yeah, had a big old fodder all about my liquid indiscretions. Every bar, every bottle. And then hung my pension over my head. Jesus. So what's our next move? We wait for the scouts to get back, and then we get thorough about this rock. I'm thinking the pylons first, unless Hellsper and her gang of merry marauders turn up little green men. Hope the aliens have beer. This cheap-ass bourbon of yours is gonna put hair on my tongue. <laughs> you lightweight. Right. <laughs> you think we should sit here on this rock? It's giving me a bad vibe. You know as well as I do that we're stuck on this <laughs> oh, bastard. Damn, this crap is Look, rough. I don't like this either. Captain Dylan Pipes to the bridge. Captain Dylan Pipes to the bridge. Sir. Yeah, <laughs> Sarah's gone all formal. You had an impact. She needed it. She's young. She'll come around. Come on, let's go see what our wide-eyed... And well-proportioned. You can keep those thoughts to yourself, Navigator. Aye, Captain. Just stating the obvious. The Captain and the Navigator. Drinking. Wentworth's just gonna love this. We might even be able to take over this bucket <laughs> and make these wannabes pay for replacing our crew on the Asimov 3. Commander Wentworth. Wentworth here. Yeah. Lieutenant Guy Rochelle, sir. I've found something you're gonna like. night was great. Uh, gonna borrow your shower. Okay. Uh, 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 he's calling me the, the sour. <laughs> I'm not doing this studio for. 
Two more hours pregame. This is chili and cheese. You club from. What? What the hell is this? Armin Kayendra, you know good from. We've been best friends for 15 years, and you boyk my boyfriend, you're a slut. You're a boyfriend? Friends for 15 years? I barely know you. What are you talking about? But that's the best point. If you want that bendejo, you can have it. I hope you catch so much shamed out STDs. <laughs> Carlson and I have been seeing each other for, for, uh... For how long? You don't even remember. I, I, I don't know. I, he's your boyfriend, too. Are you a stupid? That's what I said. Carlson is two-timing us. You, you, wait. Wait. You really don't remember our friendship. You went to Rio for your last birthday with me. Rio? Rio? I remember Rio. Sort of. Um, I really thought about it, but you were there? I bought the tickets for your birthday. You did? I, I don't remember that. I, why can't I remember? Dr. Dane, maybe right. Dr. Dane? Oh, him? Yeah. I've seen him for a longevity serum that Carlson said would keep me forever young. <laughs> Replicant. Replicant? What's a... Carlson can have you, 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 you clone trap. No. After your pregame show taping, why don't I pick you up and we can go get some Italian from... What's wrong? What's wrong? Yeah, you look like you're crying. What did I... You son of a bitch! That was Carmen Cayandra! Oh, shit. Look, I... You've been boinking her, as she put it, while seeing me? Yeah, right. Look, she's crazy. It's not And you know what else she said? She said that she and I are best friends. And I barely know she exists. She took me to Rio for my birthday last year, and I don't even remember her being there. <sighs> she said that. You know what else? She said more. Of course she did. What else? She called me a replicant. Shit. A clone! Something about Dr. Dane? What is she talking about? Look, she's crazy. <laughs> shit. She mentioned Dr. Dane. Get out! Hey, shit! That was a hundred thousand dollar vase. The one that I gave you before your trip to Rio from the Ming fucking dynasty. A little fucking respect for the Ming, please. I barely remember the trip to Rio, you asshole! Get out! Hey! I'm out of here. Just stop Get throwing! Out! <laughs> Son of a bitch. I gotta do something drastic and quick about Carmen. Shit. This is gonna send Jillian over the edge knowing the truth. Dane was supposed to have cerebral blockers to avoid this shit. But first... Dr. Dane, we need to talk. When? Try now. I'm on my way there. Shit, I got my pants. Could this day get any worse?
I told you to start. No, Crystal. Uh, something on the sphere. Octagon shape. Red. Look. Well, that doesn't mm. work. Yeah, well, we are. But it's just... Space Marine. Papa, don't. An original sci-fi audio drama, episode 2. Cast is as follows. Asmov 3, Space Probe Crew. Dylan Pike was Matthew Weller. Sarah Shields was Elaine Barrett. Adam Wentworth was Glenn Sheets. Ray Milano is Chip Joel. John Hightower, Jeff Villard. Dr. Melanie Rand, Kim Giannopoulos. Sergeant Jane Helsper, Tanya Milosevic, Wolf is Jack Halsey, Bongo, Brian, Fokikio, Guy Rochelle is Paul Mannering, Earthcast, Solar CIA Director Carlson is Lotho Tuppen, Carmen Kayandra is Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard of Gypsy Audio, Jillian G, Amanda Fitzwater, Dr. Dane, Played by Dr. John Dane, Ph.D. Solar News Director and Producer, Bill Holloway. End Credit Computer is Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard of Gypsy Audio. Music used by permission, Peter Wicks of Westlake Films. Brian Bokikio, Seraphic Panopoli. Thomas of Oakman's Dreamland and Celestial Aeon Project. More additional music by Rob Heifel. Written and mixed and produced by Bill Holloway. This has been a Broken Sea audio production, and I am your computer. Thank you for listening. Have a good evening. What a piece of work is man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculties! In form and moving! How express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! The beauty of the world! The paragon of animals! What complete rubbish! In our world, man is but a slave! Ignorant creatures used to tend the fields. None is capable of but the most rudimentary functions. Well, perhaps one. A beast with bright eyes who came to our world from a time long gone and a land far beyond. The planet of the apes. Only from Broken Sea Audio Productions. This is Bill Holwig, writer and producer of 2109 Black Sun Rising. Before tonight's show begins, I have to, well, bring everyone some bad news. Chip Joel, who played Ray Milano in 2109, this evening's episode, has passed on to the great starways in the sky. He was a talented actor, a very good person. And I'd like to call him a friend. It's sad to bring this kind of news to you, but please remember Chip. He he was just always there. And when I first started casting this show, it was about two and a half years ago. So I still have 
two episodes worth of lines left from Chip, so he'll be with us in spirit and, well, thankfully, just an honor to know him. Again, please remember Chip, and I am dedicating this episode of 2109 Black Sun Rising to the memory of Chip Joel. May fair winds following seas guide you, my friend. The following audio drama is rated PG-13 for Pretty Gory. You may experience swearing, violence, and sexual situations that you engage in often, hopefully never, and only in your dreams. Parents need to watch your children. They could learn more than you want them to. Hey, Jillian, I was thinking, after your pregame show taping, why don't I pick you up and we can go get some Italian from... What's wrong? What's wrong? Yeah, you look like you're crying. What did I... You son of a bitch! That was Conan Kayandra! Shit. Look, I... You've been boinking her, as she put it, while seeing me? Yeah, right. Look, she's crazy. It's not And you know what else she said? She said that she and I are best friends. And I barely know she exists. She took me to Rio for my birthday last year, and I don't even remember her being there. <sighs> she said that. You know what else? She said more. Of course she did. What else? She called me a replicant. Shit. A clone. Something about Dr. Dane? What is she talking about? Look, she's crazy. <laughs> shit. She mentioned Dr. Dane. Get out! Hey, shit! That was a $100,000 vase. The one that I gave you before your trip to Rio from the Ming fucking dynasty. A little fucking respect for the Ming, please. I barely remember the trip to Rio, you asshole! Get out! Hey! I'm out of here. Just stop Get throwing! Out! Hey. Son of a bitch. I gotta do something drastic and quick about Carmen. Shit. This is gonna send Jillian over the edge knowing the truth. Dane was supposed to have cerebral blockers to avoid this shit. But first... Dr. Dane, we need to talk. When? Try now. I'm on my way there. Shit, I got my pants. Could this day get any worse? Yes. Bro 
Broken Sea Audio Productions presents 2109 Black Sun Rising, an original science fiction horror drama. Episode 3 Asteroid Alpha, located halfway between Alpha Centauri and the Earth. First contact has occurred. Pike and the crew of the Asimov 3, light years from the home, now must deal with the consequences. Well, back on the Earth, CIA Soviet OSS Director Carlson's betrayals, dalliances, and covert illegal black operations are all now coming to light, all of which would destroy him and possibly topple the world power. Director Carlson is not pleased. And this makes Carlson and his solar OSS even more dangerous. Join the crew of the Asimov 3 mission on Asteroid Alpha. The year now. 2107 AD. What do you have that's so important, Ensign? Look at this. What is that? That's why I called you two up here to the command cabin. I don't know. Dr. Rand? It's in the general path you sent the scouting mission on. Oh, this just gets better and better. Cannon navigator. Go on. Sarah and I were... Ensign Shields. Uh Uh-huh. Ensign Shields and I were scanning the ruins south of the Asimov Three, The ones we first noticed after landing. Okay. Those were next on the list to check out. What did you find? While running normal topographical data scans, the ship's sensors to the north went off the scales. And then we found... this. Some kind of sphere like the others, but... is that radiation it's giving off? No. No idea what kind of energy it is. But it's intense. I think we may have found something capable of making the transmissions we were sent out here to find. But that's... Just conjecture, Captain. It's the sphere Sergeant Hellsper went to investigate, and her scouting party hasn't reported in. Ah, heard enough. Dr. Rand, raise the scouting party on the comms. I'm breaking out the artillery. Commander Hightower, assemble the crew outside now. Aye, sir. Come on, Anson. Aye. Take a bit of off the ranks. Yes, this is just fine. Captain, <laughs> if it's okay, I'll stay here and keep an eye on the object while attempting to raise the scouting party. I've never shot a weapon in my life anyway. Done. Alert me if anything changes. Oh, I will. (sighs) Captain. Oh, I will. Transport will shine like new, even after a transit to the series colony in the asteroid belt. <laughs> Fucking Carlson. Now I have to meet this son of a bitch. Shit. And I forgot to order takeout and I'm fucking hungry. Shit. So, it's commissary lunchtime. Wonderful. And with the intergalactic shams out, your transport will shine like new, even after a transit to the series colony in the asteroid belt. 
in the fucking head of the science arm of Carlson's Black Ops. My laboratory offices are located in a thousand-story skyscraper fucking named after me. I make more money than most third world countries combined. And the fucking war made lunch? Fucking special for its CEO, namely me, is Jesus. Pseudo fucking balloon. I must have been wasted when I designed that strand of edible fake fucking meat. Shit. Where's my flask? Aha. Ah. At least my malted whiskey is a masterstroke of fucking genius. Dr. Dish. What the? You? My lunch. Shit. Are you quite through, Dr. Shit. What is it with you, Carlson? Is sneaking up and fucking with people part of your fucking DNA? Yeah. Something like that. That's my commissary lunch I spilled there on the sidewalk. You should try it. Baked meat tastes like ass right up your alley. Funny. For someone whom I almost signed the orders to terminate 30 what? minutes ago. Your sense of comedic timing is impeccable. Shit. <clears throat> ah, do I have your attention? Good. Now you listen to me, you sorry motherfucker. That fucking shit you pulled with Kyandra and Jillian could compromise everything. I don't like that. So back the fuck off. We're that gentleman in the burka. See him over there? The idiot prostrated on the grass by the pink flamingos? Yeah, I see him. You don't get it, do you? Oh, do you continue? Anyway, the fucking loser praying for his path to 40 fucking virgins will go from being an annoying religious lawn jockey fanatic pissing on federally funded land to a dangerous tactical, tactical hydrogen bomb carrying nut job real fucking fast. And as he activates his come hither a la grenade strapped to his balls, you get to find out real fucking quick what the great beyond has in store for hydrogen soaked scientists with a penchant for young you, Carlson. Through? What did you say? It's English. Pay attention. If you think I'm sitting here unprotected, you're fucking more ignorant than you look. Fuck you. What are you talking the about? The squirrels, the fish in the pond over there, the larger insects. What about them? Taser bots? Taser bots? Really? You do realize that being head of the Solar OSS, I never go anywhere without being fully armed. Armor I designed. <laughs> anyway, back to these new environmentally safe gizmos I've been toying with. I didn't even kill a lab rat designed with them. The EPA will canonize me. <laughs> Get to the point. Oh, I will. Now do pay attention, Director. While your fanatic over there plays with himself trying to reach the afterlife via the hydrogen bomb expressway, you will already be wishing you were dead. Why, you may ask. The genetically altered and robotically enhanced cute and cuddly fauna here in the park in front of Dane Towers all have their targeting solutions locked and ready to fire with your nuts. The prime objective. You sorry hey, motherfucker. There's more. I also have override built into their weapon system and fed into the local Wi-Fi. You sorry, syphilitic. <sighs> so fucking what? This fucking what? If you so much as attempt to harm me, the electrical power grid of this wonderful city of yours gets fed through you via your family jewels. So though I may get blown to hydrogen hell, you will be screaming in octaves well above the human ear before we both meet Burka Boy's virgins under a hydrogen rainbow. <laughs> Check your move. We are getting nowhere. You noticed. That crap you pulled with Kyandra and Jillian screwed up a lot of shit. If you were anyone else, you'd be dead. What do you want? Give me all the vids and data of the shit you keep hanging over my head. And wipe it from all your networks, saves, hard drives, clouds, anywhere else you have that blackmail bullshit hidden. That's all. 
And don't try to fuck with me because I'll know if you retain any copies. Trust me on that. Do that, Carlson, and I'll quit calling all your jiggle pots and letting them know how big an ass you can be. Jesus. What's in the flask? Dr. Dane's finest malt whiskey. Here, new strain. Try it. Damn, that's smooth. <laughs> well, I did make it. <laughs> we have a deal? Yeah, it was getting old threatening you with the same old shit anyway. <laughs> I need to find more dirt on I'm you. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Here. Thanks. Damn you, take big swigs, Carlson. <laughs> oh. One more thing. What one thing? Do you have anything going on with Kyan? Anything sexually? She's a bit old for my taste. She's 23. Oh, right. I forgot. What are you talking about? Who are you calling? Well, Phoenix 6'9". Phoenix 6'9"? She's in the country? Fuck, man. What are you thinking? Best exterminator operative I have. <clears throat> You should know you altered it. Shit. Phoenix 69, this is Carlson. This is the fucking <clears throat> Both the beach and the bikini have been good for you on your week off. Yeah, where were you? Cleaning shop. But to business. Code tabloid is a go. Good. Are you standing on the yeah anyway? Wish I could have seen that. I bet. When? Do you ever not try to screw everything in? Fuck off, Dave. What? Not you. Fucking geek scientist with lab report bullshit. As for the job, I need it done yesterday, and I don't care how you do it or what she suffers. Comprende? Dad, that's you in the sun after if you're lucky. Oh, I'm lucky. Chat. with that psycho witch is both fucking crazy and fucking dangerous. Jesus, what did you just... Solve the Carmen Kyander problem with finality. And you never heard that. Have a good day, Dr. Dane, and I'll let you know when your file has been cleansed. It's good to know we're back on the same team again, isn't it? Shit. Oh, and when you have a chance, please, send me a case of that whiskey. It's some of your best work. Good day, Doctor. everyone assembled, Navigator? Aye, sir. All present and accounted for, with the exception of Dr. Rand, who's monitoring the object and communications on board. You can see that we're all here. Crew's not that big, sir. Something on your mind, Lieutenant Commander Wentworth? Oh, lots of things. Then we will discuss them after I am through. Until then, can it? Sir? Back to what I was saying. As you can see, I'm now armed. We have a situation on our hands. The scout team hasn't reported in, and at present we can't raise them on comms. The alien's fear that they went to investigate has started emanating unknown energy. Without knowing what or whom we're up against, from here on out, everyone is armed. Ensign Shields, here. Plasma assault rifles, here's yours. Get familiar with it, everyone gets one. See to it. Aye. As of now, people, we will start standing four hour watches in pairs, patrolling the perimeter of our base camp, plus a watch in the command cabin 24 7. Everyone stands a watch and everyone stays alert. I don't need to tell you the importance of this. We are our own keepers, saviors, protectors. There's no one else. The nearest colony is back on Pluto, well over a light year away, and we've got the only ship capable of FTL built by man, to my knowledge. And before you say it, Ensign Shields, I know there are others under construction by various other United Nations partners back home. My point is, we can only count on this crew, and this crew alone, if we are to survive. First patrol is Lieutenant Commander Wentworth, and... I don't think so, Dylan. You don't want to do this. Why is that? Lush. Et tu, Brute? Lieutenant Rochelle? Go ahead, drunk. Move. Give me a reason, Elkie. What? Dylan, 
This little party of yours is over. I was the captain of the Azimov Three till you pulled your pretty little political strings and had me demoted. I don't forget, friends. I pay my enemies back in spades. And why are you both doing this? One step closer, Lieutenant Milano, and Lush gets fragged. The rest of you, drop your weapons. As to why, in case you didn't realize this, oh, Captain <clears throat> Pike here neglected to tell you, our wonderful captain here was drinking while on duty an hour ago. Lieutenant Rochelle witnessed this and has the evidence. I will entice the lovely Dr. Rand to test the cup to confirm the validity of this for the crew shortly. She's part of the coup too? But Dylan, why? Drinking on duty? I don't understand. No, Dr. Rand is not. Just the original complement of the Asimov Three. Myself and Lieutenant Rochelle here. Not you and the rest of Dylan's darlings. Yeah. And I said to drop your weapons and some shields. Now, I will not ask you again. Yes, sir. As for our glorious captain here, before he became mission control commander on Pluto, he was the captain of the Asimov One. Saved most of the crew and came back a hero. After a disastrous mission, in the government's eyes. Ah, eh, whatever. Soon after, though, this hero's life began to unravel. After the debacle of the Asimov One mission, and the apparent loss of his beloved Captain Danny Bird on the Asimov Two mission when it went missing, he developed uh, rather a liking for the bourbon, you see. In mass quantities, I'm afraid. There was an inquiry. I am assuming his best friend, Mr. Hightower, our intrepid navigator here, pulled some strings and kept him from being kicked out of the service. Am I right, Johnny boy? Screw you. <laughs> no, screw you. Take it from me, I am right. In any event, Dylan here ended up on Pluto and took my command of the Asimov Three from me. I didn't like that, nor did my crew. Dylan here replaced most of them with you lot and then demoted the rest of us that remained in rank. That just didn't sit well with me. So now, Lieutenant Rochelle and I are taking over. I said drop your weapon, Dylan. No. What? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Ah, oh, damn it. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Ah, oh, damn it. Damn it. She's in the damned Oval Office in Preston's chair, for God's sakes, and I'm, I, 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 I'm gonna get, oh, mercy sakes, I'm gonna get court martialed. And with the intergalactic shams out, your transport will shine like new, even after a transit to the Ceres colony in the asteroid belt. <laughs> that shams out, only 1995. Put a sham now on your solar credit card. And get a second shams out for free. Throw in a transit air freshener to hang from your control pad. Booyah! 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 <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> no, next time I'm keeping score. Veers, there's no way you got a part two on the 11th. <laughs> Even a former oh, linebacker can count better than that. Did you know, Dick? I'm back in the Oval Office. Yes, it's Sergeant Hogan you hear. No, he's fine. Just uptight. Looks like he needs to tell me something. Well, I hope it's not about the Republicans. Yes, I know you are one, Veers. Hold on. Sergeant, here, take these. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, I pray for you. Really, I do. Over, 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 I'll see you on the lakes next Wednesday, Veers. Yes, deal. Now, Sergeant, what's going on? You look like you're about ready to follow. Is that... Sergeant, is that lipstick on your cheek? Uh, uh, uh... Well, she, uh, she, uh, yeah, kissed on she, uh, yeah, uh, she was in her, uh, 3D bikini, I, I couldn't stop her, well, she kissed me on the cheek, and see, I, 
I couldn't, did I mention I couldn't stop her? Hey, well, she went, <coughs> she went in, she's in the Oval Office. Who, saying, what in God's name are you talking about, Maureen? Bikini who? What is going on? Sir, I, please don't court martial me, sir, please. No, 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 no one could have stopped her, sir. Stopped I, who? Uh, uh, sir, uh, yeah. <laughs> Say for yourself, <coughs> sir. Oh, my. Mr. President. Oh, my. 3D bikini. My chair. My chair. Just allow me, Jillian G. Should I stand, Mr. President? Jillian G, 3D bikini, in my chair. Sergeant, what in the hell is going on here? Sir, uh, 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 sir, uh. Don't get all uh, mad at Sergey Wargy, Mr. President. We need to talky walky. Oh, Jillian, I, frizzy wazzy. We need could you to stop talk. Jiggling about. I, CIA Director Carlson. Can't concentrate. Jiggling. Mm. Jillian, Hi. it's time to concentrate. Treason. Jillian, I. Jillian, I. What? Carlson? And oh. what? What <laughs> the? Wazzy, wazzy. We need to talk. But first, I need you to send a car for Carmen Kayandra because, as easy as it was waltzing into the White House, just wearing my. 3D bikini, you're going to want facts and concrete evidence of Carlson's committing of Jillian, federal crimes Jillian, against I, humanity. Uh, crimes against CIA Director Carlson. <clears throat> yes, Carlson. <clears throat> Sergeant, you can close the door now. The President and I need to <clears throat> talk. Y y y yes, my <clears throat> And Mr. President, Sergeant, the car for Carmen. Wait, wait, Jillian, I. Crimes against. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, Sergeant, have the Secret Service get Carmen Kyandra over here, ASAP. Yes, sir. Now, yes, go. sir. Now, let's. <laughs> Jillian. <laughs> What? Dylan. No. <laughs> then you die. Shit. Something's wrong with my- Looking for this, Adam? No plasma cartridge. Gun no worky. Funny, I seem to have forgotten to load yours and Mr. Rochelle's guns with clips. Oops. Shit. As I informed Ensign Shields, you need to familiarize yourself with said weapons. Isn't that right, Ensign Shields? Yes, sir. 
Wow, mine works! Everyone's works, Ensign, with the exception of Mr. Wentworth and Mr. Rochelle's gun here. As I said, oops. As for the drinking on duty charge, iced tea straight from the ship's stores for me. But I saw you. I smelled the cup. I can prove it. Switch the cups. Oh, did I forget to mention that? Again. Oops. Shit. Indeed, Mr. Wentworth. But trust me, I will discipline the navigator soon enough for his indiscretion. Wonderful. Thanks, Dylan. I never trusted either of you. But you're the best in service after John and I, so I kept you both for the Asimov Three. I was hoping I could trust you both to act in a professional manner, but this old spacer wasn't born yesterday. Here's the deal. Lieutenant Guy Rochelle, Lieutenant Commander Adam Wentworth, you both attempted a coup of my ship. You have both pointed weapons at your superior officer as well as the crew. And these are acts of treason, punishable by death. I could shoot you both here and now and be well within my military regs to do so. But I won't. What? Number one, we have no room on this ship for a brig. And we aren't getting any replacements. And being as we are light years away from the nearest outpost of humanity, you're all we have. So, I'm going to forget this little incident. As long as you both follow my orders from here on out to the T. Any indiscretion from here on out. And I'm basically just going to sentence you both to death in whatever manner I think is appropriate. Do we have an understanding? Or do I line up a firing squad? Your call. Shit. You have my word. But this isn't over. Great. Then after this is over, I'll take you out behind the woodshed, Mr. Wentworth, and we'll see who comes out with a busted jaw. Hint, it won't be me. Now sit down in those chairs until I figure out what I'm going to do with you two. Now. Aye, sir. Yes, sir. All right, people, slight change of plans. Mr. Milano, you and Ensign Shields have the first watch. <whistles> Dr. Rand, have you been able to contact the scout team? <whistles> Dr. Rand? Dr. Rand. Dr. Rand, this is the captain. She's not answering, John. Come with me. Mr. Milano, you and Ensign Shields, keep an eye on our conspirators while we check on Dr. Rand. Aye, yes, sir. Oh, this just gets better and better, Dylan. You drank tea while well, I drank that crap. <laughs> Sorry about the setup, but I had a hunch. You realize I'm going to have to discipline you. Wonderful. <laughs> I'll have to restrict you to this asteroid for your breach of protocol. You know, till we take off, of course. Oh, thanks. But why keep these assholes around? You know how it is, John. Keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. You know, plus they're good at their jobs, and now they're under my thumb, so... Shit, I wonder what's up with Dr. Rand. And me too. Hey, but where'd you get Rand anyway? The rest of us have worked on and off with you for years. You know... <laughs> I, I can't for the life of me, remember? Asimov 3, this is Scout Team 1. We have found something. 
I repeat, we have found something. The sphere in sector four uh, minor opened. We have warned it. Heading back to base unless otherwise notified. Advise. Asimov three, come in. Shit. Nothing. Answer. Wish I knew. Asimov three, come in. We have wounded. This is Scout Team One. We have found something. I repeat, we have found something. The sphere in Sector Four Nine are opened. We we have wounded. Heading back to base unless otherwise notified. Advise. Asimov three, come in. Shit. Original Sci-Fi Audio Drama, Episode 3. Cast. Narrator, Jack Ward of the Sonic Society. Asmov 3 Crew, Matthew Weller as Dylan Pike. Elaine Barrett as Sarah Shields. Chip Joel as Ray Milano. Jeff Ballard as John Hightower. Kim Giannopoulos as Dr. Melanie Rand. Adam Wentworth. Douglas of the Renaissance band Howell O. Paul Mannering as Guy Rochelle. Asmov Three Spec Op Marine. Jane Helsper is Tanya Milizhevet. Wolf Jack Holsey. Bongo. Brian Fokikio. Earthcast. Lothar Tuppen as Carlson. Dr. John Dane, PhD, as Dr. Dane. Amanda Fitzwater as Jillian G. Gwendolyn Johnson Woodard of Gypsy Audio as Carmen Kayandra. Ginny Ward as Phoenix 69. Mark Olson as the President of the United States. Bill Holloway as Sergeant Hogan. The end credit computer was read by Gwendolyn Johnson Woodard of Gypsy Audio. Music provided by Peter Wicks of Westlake Films. Brian Bokikio of the Seraphic Panoply, Thomas of Oakland's Dreamland, Rob Highfield, Douglas of Howl O, and the Celestial Aeon Project. Written, mixed, and produced by Bill Holway. This has been a Broken Sea audio production. Chip Joel, you will be missed. And I am Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard of Gypsy Audio. Thank you for listening. Ain't Timber, because Timber's still in Serenity. I buried him there. What do you mean, you buried him? Well, I pulled this gun, and I put a hole in his head. Sarge, you didn't bury me. Atlanta Minx, prepare to be boarded. Things check out, we won't be staying long. Boys? Oh! Greetings, traveler. I am Initiate of the Tenth Order, Lemangelo. Now move, Shepard. I don't know how long we have before things start going all to hell. I am afraid, Captain. It is far too late for that. Look who I've discovered. Hi. Would you please stop shooting at us? Well, that didn't work. Anyone else have a plan? No 
Now it don't need to go this way. I ain't been right more times than I've been alive. But I aim to do right a fraction more when it counts. Firefly Old Wounds. Hello, this is Alan Tudyk. And this is Nathan Fillion. Saying hello to the Sonic Society. If you're not listening to the Sonic Society, what are you doing? You're dead like wash. That's what. Please join us each week at the Sonic Society. You can find us at sonicsociety.org or at any of the major directories like the podcast Pickle or iTunes. Join us, won't you? And when you come, bring a friend. Bombed. Dangerous. The relic! Sophisticated. Are you ready to order? Romantic. And beautiful. Bond. Lara Bond. I bet you didn't know James had a sister, did you? Move in! Double O twelve. Lara Bond. Only at imaginationlane.net. What? You were expecting someone else? In 1963, Pierre Boulle's book, La Planète des Sanges, known in English as Planet of the Apes, was published. In 1968, 20th Century Fox released Planet of the Apes as a major motion picture, creating a worldwide sensation that continues to this day. In 1975, Mike McCarthy, Tom McCabe, Michael A. Caulfield, and Bill Kenwright brought Planet of the Apes to stages in the United Kingdom, the history and script of which was preserved by Rich Handley of Hasline Books, Simeon Scrolls Magazine, and the Planet of the Apes Wikia site. In 2013, Broken Sea Audio, in arrangement with playwright Mike McCarthy, brings you the official audio drama adaptation of the UK stage production of Planet of the Apes. Don't move, human! Okay, okay, my hands are up! Silence, beast! Human, what do you want here? We are friends. We come in peace. Come in peace, have they? We shall soon see about that. Put them in a cage. Yes, sir. Move, beasts. What? But we came in peace. In the cage. Human. This is Jake Sampson, Monster Hunter. I don't always listen to old-time radio or podcast audio dramas. But when I do, I prefer BrokenSea.com. Stay listening, my friends. Without warning, they came from the sky. Creatures similar in origin, yet so very different from us. Commander Taylor, this ship is now entering the the Barbarian Quadrant. Wonderful. Time has come for... I'm getting there. <sighs> Space. So ends my last signal until we reach our destination. We call them ignorant. Savages. Until one day, one of the beasts spoke. Taylor! Why 
can't you run away? Security police, Dr. Zira. I'm in charge of this man. Go down there, Dr. Zira. He is now in my custody. General Ursus. <laughs> Get your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. Taylor. <laughs> and the teachings of our great lawgiver were called into question. Beware the beast man, for he is the devil's paw. Let him not breed in great numbers, for he will make a desert of his home and yours. Shun him, for he is the harbinger of death. death. Indeed, we learned the truth, and we exposed what had for many generations been forbidden. The man-beast also possessed an intellect, one that made him all the more dangerous. Praise the Alpha. Bless the Omega. Praise the wisdom of the bomb. Praise, Praise the wisdom, the of, wisdom the bomb. of the bomb. Praise the wisdom of the bomb. Join us once again as Broken Sea Audio Productions takes you beyond the imagination into the land beneath the planet of the apes. Adapted and expanded from the original script by Paul Den and Mort Abrams, based on the world created by Pierre Boulle. Only at BrokenSea.com. Broken Sea Audio Productions would like to apologize in advance to anyone who is offended or otherwise concerned about the content of Ulysses, Galactic Guides and Bounties, Inc. As a gesture, we would like to offer a free gift. Send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to Sydney H. Ulysses, care of BrokenSeaAudio.com, the internet. We will then send you blueprints for a chasm-spanning structure. We suggest you utilize these to fill the bridge and get over it. In the year 1988, the crime rate in the United States rises 400%. The once great city of New York becomes the one maximum security prison for the entire country. A 50-foot containment wall is erected along the New Jersey shoreline, across the Harlem River, and down along the Brooklyn shoreline. It completely surrounds Manhattan Island. All bridges and waterways are mined. The United States police force, like an army, is encamped around the island. The prison's name, New York Maximum Security Penitentiary, Manhattan Island. There are no guards inside the prison, only prisoners and the worlds they have made. This is the Broken Sea Audio production of Escape from New York. You go in, find the president, and bring him out in 24 hours, and you're a free man. I'll think about it. No time. Give me an answer. Let's get a new president. Trade Center dead ahead. Should be there now. <laughs> the ex
accepted. What comes next can be anything. Most mothers call their children little angels. Mine just happened to be right. What did that mean? I don't know other than I heal faster and age slower than anyone around me. And sometimes, I know things. Something dark and evil is coming to Gypsy Cove. Something we're meant to stop. Myself, my family, and the good people of town. The problem is, in a town like this, good and evil don't wear signs. And no one knows for sure. I think, hope, and pray that I and my family are ready for what is coming. When the fight comes down, what side will you be on? Gypsy Cove, coming to Gypsy Audio, 2010. GypsyAudio.org Right House Audio this audio drama is not suitable for children, those of a sensitive constitution, and anyone who finds audio representation of extreme violence and gore disturbing. You have been warned. Right House Audio. What the hell do you want? <laughs> I'm Trixie Cluster Flaffy, your zombie cheerleader for the evening. Yeah, normal. Yes. Every day zombie. Fucking cheerleaders. <laughs> Here. Be yeah, yeah. Don't get your panties in a knot. <laughs> now we are just hungry. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, I think I'm tripping. Dude, I see dead people. Fucking zombie cheerleaders stomping on the herb. Grindhouse Audio presents <laughs> the most sickening audio production ever released from the studio that brought you Dead, Dead, Dead and the town that went to hell. No, man. I'm fucking serious. Zombie cheerleaders. Zombie cheerleaders. In the 26th century, Earth thrives after recovering from nearly total ecological catastrophe. To prevent similar disasters from happening on other worlds, Earth and the Galactic Confederation built a massive interstellar arc the zoo ship Gaia. Commanded by Captain Elizabeth Monroe, Gaia's mission is to protect wildlife and habitats on worlds throughout the galaxy. These are their adventures. There are heroes. The galaxy is full of bad guys, and in order to take out the trash, you have to be willing to get your hands dirty. Oh, see, sense woman. Why do you always have to do things the hard way? There are villains. You will all feel my wrath very soon. <laughs> we are the stuff of nightmares. We are all that civilized races fear in the dark. And there are those somewhere in between. I am an assassin woman. I am the assassin of assassins. I'm not a dog to grovel at your feet. 
I never ask anyone to grovel. That would be uncivilized. In season one of Gaia's Voyages, these forces collide, and the fate of Gaia and her crew stands on the edge of a Venjari blade. Broken Sea Audio Productions presents Gaia's Voyages, only at www.brokensea.com. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your president speaking. I just wanted to say that I support Broken Sea Productions and all the fine work that they're doing for this country. Where's that intern? Hey, yo. You think you can let that intern in here just for a couple minutes before I go see the Russian premiere? <laughs> I'm having problems lighting my cigar. Oh. I thought you would never ask. <laughs> This week's show, we'll catch you all next week as we continue our look back at the genius of Bill Holwig. Thanks so much again, amigos, for the ride. Uh, thank Bye, you, everybody. Jack, and thank you, Lothar. And I'll Thanks, Jack. You Thanks, Jeff, and uh, we'll see you next week. Yes. You betcha. Good night. Good night. Good night. Anyway, this is Bill.
Laters is built from West Texas. Bye. Damn, Bill. Re-listening to all these shows again make me realize just how much you mix the heck out of every show you do.